Good evening and a very warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Uh, and it's good to see so many of you here. The Oxford Martin School was created to deal with the greatest challenges of the 21st century. And of course, a question that arises uh, is when and why would one engage in direct action uh, to make these challenges uh, ones that we are able to address on climate, on poverty, uh, and on so many other things. And so I'm absolutely delighted today uh, that my very good old friend uh, Kumi Naidu has agreed to come uh, and address us on this topic. Kumi uh, has engaged in direct action and thought about these issues for a very long time. Uh, when he was 15 at school, uh, he was expelled for engaging in direct action uh, and uh, starting a civil uh, society movement being part of it in South Africa, and then going on to engage in many issues on gender, on civil rights, uh, across the board, uh, and eventually, uh, despite that, was able to get a degree cum laude from the university in Durban, uh, and to come to Oxford uh, in 1987 as a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and eventually get his doctorate here. So uh, he's someone who's really managed to, despite the hardships of uh, not having completed school uh, and being in the struggle uh, managed to come here and those of you that have achieved Rhodes Scholars and I know there are many here this evening uh, and have done a doctorate at Oxford will know uh, that's no mean feat. He's gone on uh, to lead many uh, different civil rights movements uh, thinking about the issues, providing leadership, uh, Sangoko, which is South African civil rights organization, then going back when President Mandela was released uh, to lead uh, as the spokesperson the International elect the Independent Electoral Commission uh, to train the people that were doing their vote for 1994, and then went on to lead Civicus which is a global alliance of uh, civil society organizations for 10 years. And I encountered Kumi along this way in many different occasions, uh, occasionally on the other side of a negotiating table when I was uh, responsible for these issues at the World Bank and uh, Kumi came to tell me how bad we were doing. Um, and it was always uh, an intimidating moment to be on the other side of a negotiating table from Kumi. But of course, we would always maintain our friendship and it's been one of the pleasures of coming to Oxford. I don't have to represent any organization anymore. We can just be good friends and I can tell him how wonderful he is. Um, he's been the executive director of Greenpeace for four years. Uh, he's done remarkable things there. It's an extraordinary organization, which is uh, membership driven, uh, doesn't accept uh, finances from any large corporates uh, or others, uh, just through three and a half million members around the world. And as you know, um, it's been in the news a lot on actions it's been taking on climate change, not least uh, of all recently uh, in Greenland, where Kumi was arrested, um, and with the Arctic 30. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you, Kumi, and to hear from you. Kumi will speak for about 45 minutes or so. We'll have a Q&A, uh, and then we'll have an even better thing afterwards, which you'll all be invited to join us for a drink uh, next door. Kumi. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Good afternoon, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Very good to be back at Oxford. Uh, I wasn't going to tell the story, but since you mentioned Rhodes Scholarship and so on, I, I should tell you about my first day at Oxford. I'd been on the run in South Africa during the state of emergency and eventually had to flee. I'd never been out of South Africa before. I had got the Rhodes Scholarship four months before I was to flee. I didn't really fully understand what the Rhodes Scholarship was, by the way, uh, <laughs> at that time. and. Anyway, eventually managed to get out of the country, landed at uh, Heathrow, arrived at Oxford, and because I arrived six months before my scholarship could start, I didn't have accommodation and so on, so I had to stay at the Rhodes Trust, at the Rhodes House, sorry. And so I go to bed at nine o'clock after having dinner. I hadn't slept for like two days, and I didn't close the curtains, they were still open. And anyway, I fell asleep with my clothes on. And then at 12 o'clock, there was a knock on the door. And bear in mind, for the last three months, I'd been on the run from, for the police at home. So whenever there's a knock on the door, you panic. So I woke up, and it 
it was 12 o'clock by then, and uh, a very nice woman comes in and says, Sir, can I bring you some toast and tea? <laughs> I look at her, I, I look in front of me, and the night before it had snowed. So I'd never seen snow in my life before. So suddenly I look in front of me, I see snow. I'd never been offered breakfast in bed before. <laughs> And certainly, I should confess, there was ne I'd never had a white woman in my room before. A combination of these things, I was saying, Shh, where exactly am I? <laughs> so for a brief moment, I thought I was dead, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Ian, for coming up with this topic, uh, direct action, when and why. Um, it is, I believe, a very topical question of our time. But to answer the question, is direct action appropriate and when is it appropriate or not, we can only answer that question meaningfully by asking the question, what is the world we live in at the moment? So I want to start by giving you a sense of how I see the world. Essentially, when the Berlin Wall came down and when the Soviet Union collapsed, the world was promised a peace dividend. We are told that the huge amounts of resources that were going into the Cold War, intelligence, military spending, and so on, will now go towards the real things that mattered to people. Actually, in reality, military expenditure has actually increased, not decreased. But part of that conversation was that there was going to be an explosion of democracy around the world. But when we look at the quality of democracy we have in the world today, I think we come to a very sad conclusion. In many countries around the world today, we have elections without democracy, or we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. When you look at the United States today, for example, a country that sees itself as, as a promoter of democracy, that democracy can best be described today as the best democracy money can buy. And if you look, for example, on the climate question, in the United States, one of the reasons we do not have movement is that for every member of Congress, the fossil fuel industry subsidizes a minimum of three and a maximum of eight full-time lobbyists to make sure no progressive climate legislation passes. <laughs> we know that on gender, even though we've been talking about gender equality for decades and decades, we still have a reality in our democratic institutions on a global basis that in leadership positions, less than 10% are uh, women who occupy those positions. And I dare say that that problem clearly afflicts the business community, and I want to say also that the civil society community is not uh, immune from addressing the gender equality question. When we look at all of that, and we ask ourselves the question, what was democracy really intending to do? And I put the wallet versus the ballot there because part of the logic around democracy was to balance the power of those with wealth with the voices of ordinary people. That's the balance between the ballot and the wallet. Clearly, that has not happened. Second problem we have is that we are living in a world today where many of the challenges that we face cannot be addressed by national governments alone. They have to be addressed through global processes and through global institutions. We cannot solve climate change or oceans protection or global finance by one country acting on its own or even a set of countries acting on its own. But the problem we have is that basically as the world was changing after the fall of the Berlin Wall and globalization became the much talked about word, what we found was that when places like South Africa and the successor states of the former Soviet Union were getting democracy for the first time, the real power had already began to shift from the national to the supranational level. So you know, even with regard to the UK and Europe, there are certain powers that are moving uh, upwards. The problem we have is most of our global governance institutions, uh, which was the conversations I used to have with Ian when he was at the World Bank, <laughs> is that they are stuck in the geopolitics of 1945. So let me tell you, for British citizens, this might not be a nice thing for me to say in the way I'm going to say it, but in 1945, it made sense for why, for example, the UK and France would have a veto at the Security Council uh, 
as a permanent member because in 1925, for better or for worse, the UK and France were colonial hegemons controlling large amounts of the world's population. Today, there is no persuasive argument for why France and Britain, for example, should retain the veto, unless you say because you want to reward them for having weapons of mass destruction in the form of nuclear weapons. If you do that, then you should grant, then of course, a permanent seat in the Security Council to Pakistan, India, North Korea, uh, Israel and others. So we got a global governance system that has huge challenges put on its shoulders, but it's fundamentally undemocratic. It suffers from a democratic deficit, a coherence deficit, meaning that the way different UN and global institutions operate, it's very territorial and so on. Then you've got a compliance deficit. After expensive meetings, right, all these summits, if you go back and evaluate any UN summit, any G8 summit, any G20 summit, I would be extremely shocked if you can show a 50% compliance rate. Right? I mean, if you can show a 20% compliance rate, it would be good going in terms of decisions made and how it's not implemented. Right here in London, in 2009, the G20 said, we need to scrap fossil fuel subsidies. We are almost five years later, not one meaningful step has actually been taken, for example. That's what I mean by the compliance deficit. And all those deficits come together to create what I would call a legitimacy deficit. So our global institutions, at a time when we need global governance, is lacking. Often we talk about social exclusion in many parts of the world, in both the academic sense as well as in activism, as if social exclusion inflicts a minority of people. But actually, if you think about who is socially excluded in the world today, you come up with a very troubling conclusion. Because let's look at it. Because generally, when in the literature in European uh, social movements and so on, what you would find is when you talk about social exclusion, you're looking at minorities, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, people with uh, alternative sexual orientation or, and, and, and uh, maybe Roma. You know, I'm just thinking in the European context, for example. But actually, if you add to the fact that today, many young people across the world feel socially excluded, if you look at the fact that today many older citizens also feel socially excluded, the fact that most women in the world feel socially excluded, then you come up actually to a very uncomfortable conclusion that those that are socially excluded and those that feel socially included, that actually those that are socially excluded are actually the majority, not the minority. And hence, giving some justification, and a, I think powerful justification, to the idea of what the Occupy movement came out in terms of the framing of the 1% versus the 99%. The role of civil society over the last decade has been very, very embraced by political leaders, heads of UN institutions, and so on. I jokingly, when Ian kindly convinced the president of the World Bank at that time for me to come and address the bank, I said, you know, these days, the president of the bank, the US president, um, Secretary General of the UN cannot make a major policy speech without the term civil society rolling off their tongues at the speed of a Boeing 747. But what embracing of the role of civil society is being acknowledged? And I would argue that mostly the role of civil society that is embraced by governments and business is the service delivery role, not the role of being the advocate, the challenger, the monitor, the pusher to do more and fulfill what promises are made. So essentially, to put it in a different way, I would categorically say in a context where more than 80 governments just in the last five years have tried to actually restrict the space for civil society by passing regulations, laws, and so on, when you see that happening, then you have to come to the uncomfortable conclusion that in fact many of our political and business leaders, including in certain Western democracies, really see civil society as cheap labor. Right? And, and to actually, you know, do some of the service delivery that they cannot do, and that's very much the reality in developing country spaces. The war on terror and the way it was implemented, uh, really, firstly, we should never have called our response to September 11th the war on terror, because it's ethically, strategically, tactically, and actually linguistically flawed.
because terror is a tactic. How do you weigh a war on tactic? We know governments use terror all the time, and there's books you can write about that. Uh, but, and, and just to remind you, Greenpeace itself has been a victim of act of terrorism 27 years ago when the French government, one of the oldest of the veto at the United Nations, bombed illegally a Greenpeace ship in Auckland, the Rainbow Warrior, 27 years ago. How many of you remember that? Please put your hands up. Okay, you're either old or you follow uh, <laughs> uh, history. So, thank you. So, yes, so I'm glad I mentioned that because half of you don't know, it was a completely illegal act, an act of terrorism conducted by a veto-wielding member of the United uh, Nations. But what we have seen as a result of the way the war on terrorism has been prosecuted, there's been shrinking of democratic space, and particularly its impact on civil society has made it very, very difficult for civil society activists to move around the world. Uh, myself, if I were to write a book about an autobiography of trying to do a global job coming from Africa, looking in the unfortunate way I look. Uh, the title of the book would be Visas, well, I was going to use a more a stronger expletive, but Visas, Bloody Visas. Right? But, but actually, I can tell you, conference after conference you go to, there are people from certain parts of the world are denied voice as a result of some of the things that have been done as a result of the war on terror. Of course, we are dealing with a climate and environmental crisis where we are fast running out of time. But central to the problem we have in the world today is that democracy is not distributing resources in a reasonably equitable way. This statistic should be one that all of us should be ashamed. That 85 people in the world own as much as 3.5 billion of the poorest people. This level of inequality is completely unsustainable. It's not justified, it, uh, and, and you know, we can go into how the people made the money, how, how much of it was legal, how much of it was corruption, all of that. But in a world where WWF tells us that if we were to deliver the lifestyle that people in Europe and the developed world and the elites in the developing world take for granted as norm, then we would have to find between three to eight planets to deliver that to everybody in the world and not necessarily the upper end of luxury jets and three Porsches, but I'm talking about middle class level of consumption. And that is a fact, an elephant in the room that our political leaders are struggling to engage with. But the moment of history that we're living on now can be called a, it has been called a perfect storm. I called it in a book in 2009, um, Boiling Point, which where we've seen a convergence of economic, financial, um, and uh, environmental crises all coming together in a very short space of time. And you might remember Ram Emanuel, who was President Obama's um, chief of staff in the White House. And when we reached that moment in 2008, 2009, he very famously said, a good crisis is a very bad thing to squander. And sadly, I have to say that our political and business leadership has squandered that crisis moment that we reached where we should have looked at how do we change uh, to move forward. I'm not going to cover all of this because it will take too long. But what I want to just say to you that in all the planetary boundaries that we are uh, facing, we are running out of time. On climate change, we went to Copenhagen in 2005 to the climate negotiations with the world saying, we need to get a fair, ambitious, and legally binding climate treaty agreed there that we should get emissions to peak by 2015 and start coming down. We failed to do that, and now our political leaders have completely ignored the science and they've just shifted the agenda to say, okay, we failed in Copenhagen in 2009, we'll get that deal in Paris in 2015, we might or might not, and then they say, we will only start implementing the big changes that we need in 2020. And by the way, let me just say, as an African, I don't need climate science anymore to tell me that climate change is real and it's happening. The people on my continent are being ravaged by climate impacts. History will record that the so-called genocide in Darfur was actually the first major resource war brought about by climate impacts. If you think I'm crazy in saying this, I refer you to a report 
commissioned by the CIA in the Pentagon. Now, I must confess that it's not often I start a sentence like the one I'm just about to start. <laughs> I strongly support the CIA and the Pentagon when, in 2003, they presented a report to President Bush which said that in the coming two decades, the biggest threat to peace and security will not come from conventional threats, will not come from terrorism, but will come from the impacts of climate change. And Darfur is located right next to Lake Chad. Lake Chad was one of the largest inland seas in the world, and in the words of the current Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, it shrunk to the size of a pond. Uh, so water scarcity, land scarcity, combining, contributing to food scarcity, was a toxic mix that actually created, and we know that the Sahel Desert is marching southwards at the rate of one mile a year, taking away valuable uh, agricultural land. So let me not go through all of it, but I'll just tell you we are running out of time in all areas. I just will take oceans. Because of the triple, triple whammy we have in our oceans of overfishing, uh, dumping of toxics, including oil spills, and ocean acidification. Ocean, ocean acidification is a problem, to put very simply, more and more carbon emissions, less and less forests. The excess uh, carbon is ending up in our oceans and essentially uh, turning our ocean to acid. And, in, and it's having impact on coral reefs and so on. And Newsweek, the weekly journal, not the most environmentally friendly or most radical magazine in the world, two years ago, on the front page, said, on the cover said, because of humanity's rapaciousness and greed, that in fact in the next 40 years all that will be left in our oceans is algae and jellyfish. So 40 years is not a long time. It's within our lifetime. And it's within our capacity to change, but the problem is we are suffering from a terrible, terrible case of cognitive dissonance, where all the facts are there and urges us to act, and we refuse to do that. I'm seeing a little bit of puzzle faces, so I'm going to take a deviation for a second to tell you, not give you the technical definition of cognitive dissonance, but give you an example. 2004, the US troops finally get to Baghdad. Saddam Hussein's Minister of Communications is still in power. He's addressing them. And he gets asked, how are you coping with these challenges, and how long you think you will stand the war effort, and so on, and he says, what war? What are you talking about? We are completely in control. And behind him, buildings are burning, bombs are dropping. That is the image I want to urge you to think about how our political leaders are dealing with, with climate change. Because in fact, according to Kofi Annan's foundation, we are now already losing in excess of 500,000 lives annually from direct climate impacts. And this is something that just does not allow greater delays that we are seeing. Because I just conclude by saying, uh, before I go into the direct action piece, that our political leaders, when we meet with them on a one-to-one -one basis, there's almost no disagreement. I can tell you, even CEOs of big companies, when I present the facts and we tell them we're running out of time, etc., they often agree with us. But the default position of business as usual <coughs> is one that they cannot break out. And essentially what we are seeing is incremental baby steps in the right direction when what is needed is quite significant change. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any other word in psychology. It is the word maladjusted. It is the ringing cry of modern child psychology, maladjusted. Now, of course, we all want to live a well-adjusted life in order to avoid neurotic and schizophrenic personalities. But as I move toward my conclusion, I would like to say to you today, in a very honest manner, that there are some things in our society and some things in our world for which I'm proud to be maladjusted. And I call upon all men of goodwill to be maladjusted to these things until the good society is realized. I must honestly say to you that I never intend to adjust myself to racial segregation and discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. 
I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few and leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. Martin Luther King was probably one of the first earliest advocates to use the term nonviolent direct action. Uh, in, when he was in prison in Birmingham, he wrote what was famously known as Letter from a Birmingham Jail, and uh, where he says, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not white citizens counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly say, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believe he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Moving further in history then, the one of the first time civil disobedience, which is fundamentally related to nonviolent direct action, uh, was Thoreau, already writing in the 19th century, saying, unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them, or shall we endeavor to amend them? And obey them until we have succeeded, or shall we transgress them at once? John Adams pitches in with, we want to create a government of laws not a gov uh, and not of men. And hence, we see the currency of the term and embracement by probably all of us in this room about the importance of the rule of law. I'm going to challenge you now on whether slavishly just accepting the rule of law as a given is a good thing. And this is Matt Damon, which I think most of you know. But he's going to be reading from a thinker in the US, Howard Zinn, writing about 30 years back about the question of civil disobedience and the rule of law. You're saying our problem is civil disobedience. That is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is the numbers of people all over the world who have obeyed the dictates of the leaders of their government and have gone to war, and millions have been killed because of this obedience. We recognize this for Nazi Germany. We know that the problem there was obedience, that the people obeyed Hitler. People obeyed. That was wrong. They should have challenged, and they should have resisted. <laughs> but now we have Western civilization, the rule of law. The rule of law has regularized and maximized the injustice that existed before the rule of law. That is what the rule of law has done. When in all the nations of the world, the rule of law is the darling of the leaders and the plague of the people, we ought to begin to recognize this. We have to transcend these national boundaries in our thinking. Nixon and Brezhnev have much more in common with one another than we have with Nixon. J. Edgar Hoover has far more in common with the head of the Soviet secret police than he has with us. It's the international dedication to law and order that binds the leaders of all countries in a comradely bond. That's why we're always so surprised when they get together. They smile, they shake hands, they smoke cigars. They really like one another no matter what they say. <laughs> we're going to need to go outside the law to stop obeying the laws that demand kill. Sorry. Uh, just to clarify, that was not uh, Matt Damon's words. He's reading the words of our gentleman, obviously he embraces it. And the question before us, it's a troubling question. I'll be upfront with you, say, I always, if anybody asks me even 
one year ago, do you embrace the rule of law? I would have said yes. I think we've reached a time now where we have to interrogate what is an appropriate usage of the rule of law. Because bear in mind, slavery was once legal. Colonialism was once legal. Apartheid was once legal. Denying women the right to vote was once legal. Just because it's legal doesn't make it just, does not make it right. And in fact, when we look at an issue like gender equity, for example, it is scandalous that the knowledge that we've had about the importance of gender equity for overall development indices is critically important, that in fact we have essentially had baby steps and incremental steps. And, and sometimes we in the civil society movement also get caught up in the trap where we also feel a sense that we have to exaggerate the successes of what we are achieving. But what makes it also complex is that when we think of civil uh, disobedience and nonviolent direct action, it has to interconnect between the legal framework in the country, the, valid, the, the elections frameworks, and of course, increasingly, sadly, in many countries we see the form of democracy without the substance, and elections are sadly becoming preordained elite legitimating exercises in many parts of the world. And and, when, and then, of course, this is connected to the whole question of what is the morality and virtue that we should be seeking for. So, when we ask the question, why direct action? The first answer I'll say is because logic alone simply doesn't work. And I think some of you are familiar with the first law of cartoon physics, which is gravity doesn't work until you look down. But the difficulty for activism is that most of the time, this is the situation that we have. It is really a David and Goliath struggle. And I'm deeply honored that one of the Davids of Greenpeace, Phil Ball, who spent 100 plus days in prison in Russia, is here with us. And I'll invite him into the conversation later. But when we were standing up to the Arctic and to what we found, uh, by the way, that's not full, eh? <laughs> if you're wondering. <laughs> So let's quickly summarize the history of how civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action evolves. It emerges in the 1848 essay by Thoreau. We see the Boston Tea Party, which people are familiar with. We see resistance to colonial rule, and Mahatma Gandhi particularly gave global resonance to particularly peaceful nonviolent direct action. And incidentally, Martin Luther King publicly you know, acknowledged his debt to Gandhi as contributing to uh, the embracing of um, peaceful resistance. Of course, we've had the resistance in apartheid South Africa. We, we saw student sit-ins in the United States around the Vietnam War. We've seen the democracy movement uh, in Myanmar, Burma. And of course, the list is significantly longer. But again, let's look at how history judges the people who engage in, in nonviolent direct action and how they get judged when they're doing it. So I thought, I asked my colleagues to go and find four photographs of four people when they were in prison. Right? So there's Martin Luther King, 41 times thrown in prison by the US state. Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison. I should confess that that's a bit of a cheat photograph. That was when he went back for a visit. He, he was out of prison by then. Uh, Rosa Parks and Mahatma Gandhi. Then look at this. This is how we now regard them. So Mandela, only human being in the world where all countries in the world declared his birthday as the International Day for Social Justice Efforts on 18th of July. Rosa Parks, there's a memorial. Martin Luther King has a memorial in Washington DC that is as big as any president as a memorial today. If you have ever get to DC, go see it. And of course, that's Mahatma Gandhi's um, memorial. I have no doubt that the people that are so-called saying crazy things today, and the people that are putting their lives on the line, history will record them in the same way that some of these movements have been recorded. But there is a difference. The moment of history that we are living, and the challenge of climate change means, potentially, there'll be nobody to record that history. 
And I should say, yeah, when I say things like that, when I'm in the United States, when you know, I, I start by saying this is how bad things are, I had this woman put up a hand, an African-American woman says to me, Mr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? I said, yes. And then she said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? And I thought it was a trick question, so I was very tentatively saying, uh, I have a dream. She said, yes, I have a dream, but when you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare. <laughs> and let me say that that's the difficult challenge for us at the moment. How do you speak truth to power on the one hand? How do you say, listen, we are in deep crisis. We are running out of time. We have to act with great uh, emergence, uh, urgency and so on on the one hand. And how do you say it in a way that people want to leave the hall and walk out and get involved to fight that fight? I still passionately believe that while for many people in the world it is too late, and sadly, the people that are paying the first and most brutal price in terms of climate impacts are the ones that have emitted the least carbon, and in some cases, virtually no carbon. And when you have that reality of people already perishing in numbers, then you have to say it as it is, but also recognize that it's not lost. Greenpeace and then other environmental organizations are honestly saying that the assessment of our performance at the moment is that we are winning wars, sorry, we are winning ba important battles, but we're losing the planet and losing the war because the, the amount of victories we're winning is not taking out sufficient chunks of carbon from our atmosphere. And I put it to you very honestly that this is one of the biggest challenges that we actually face. But just to round up with some more very specific things on civil disobedience, uh, probably John Rawls' 1971 article was one of the most important in terms of framing it as public, nonviolent, and conscientious breach of law undertaken with the aim of bringing about a change in laws or government policies. So if you look at it as a continuum of options available to activists, legal protests, and 80% of what Greenpeace and other environmental groups are, are actually legal stuff, very formal, boring, stuff going to UN conventions and so on, and doing the scientific work, the research work, and so on. And just to shock some of you, the image that Greenpeace has that we're out there doing actions all the time, that does not even constitute 20% of, of our activity. Right? That 20% falls in that second part of the continuum. And then I'll come back to this in a second, but also I got asked to speak about direct action. But actually, there's two types of direct action. There's nonviolent direct action as well as direct action that does include, you know, revolutionary action. And, you know, it was very interesting, and I invite you to go read the Hansard of the British Parliament special session on Mandela's passing. I had a very nice member of Parliament send it to me. And I tell you, it was quite difficult to read through. Not because what they said was not nice. But I was a student in this country, and I'm seeing some names of people who were saying completely the opposite when Mandela was in prison, who have completely revised the history to actually embrace that which has now become norm. And the challenge of progressive citizenship right now is the ability to challenge a status quo that works for a minority of the people in the world, and certainly not the majority. Um, Martin Luther King, in terms of why, answering the question, you say, you may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for direct, uh, for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. I just would quickly, in the interest of time, say that I ask my colleagues, do we use civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action interchangeably, or is it exactly the same thing? And I said, tell me what's the difference. And, and so the purpose is the same. And by the way, this is not gospel truth. The purpose is the same. The intention is to impart information and opinions, highlight issues, sensitize the public, and challenge the status quo. 
The goal is to challenge the lack of reinforcement of a law or the absence of the law from a non-violent direct action point of view. On civil disobedience, we're pushing more for, to challenge laws and, and is a refusal to comply with an existing unjust law. I won't go through all of it, but that gives you a sense. I was trying to struggle with this issue of whether it's exactly the same, but there are distinctions. I want to quickly say here that having lived through the anti-apartheid struggle, I have no doubt in my mind that the use of violence is self-defeating, that it's tactically flawed, um, and actually, even though the power of the state and the brutality of the state can sometimes cause tremendous loss of life, violence does not actually counter that loss of life. And I would like to just evoke um, the philosopher and uh, sociologist Louis Althusser, who, writing in the late 70s, drew a very important distinction between what he called the repressive state apparatus and the ideological state apparatus. And far too often, we make the mistaking, mistake of thinking that governments control us by the use of the army, the police force, the formal use of laws, and so on. But actually, more important is the ideological appar uh, state apparatus, the media environment, the framework for religion, the schooling system, and so on. I mean, if you look at the United States today, I would say you don't need to use the repressive state apparatus ever because the ideological state apparatus is so powerful that, in fact, you got what Cornell West, the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard, very late for Harvard, by the way, uh, said that what you have in the United States today is a situation of inverted authoritarianism. Long story, look it up if you want to know more. <laughs> So, what are the features then of civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action? There is generally a sense of people who are doing it are very conscientious, very concerned, and, and really feel moved to, in some cases, put their lives on the line. Communicating the purpose, the objective, and where you want to end up is a key part of it. I would say that the communications component of our work is a big challenge because when Greenpeace, say, goes up against Gazprom, Gazprom's marketing budget alone is five times all the Greenpeace resources in the world combined. Right? So when we look at the fight that we're having with all the coal companies in the US running these clean coal advertisements, you know, unstoppable on US television, that is what we're against. So we're looking at the communication and publicity to try to counter the narrative but you need to see it in a David and Goliath sense. And fundamentally, it's about st staying true to nonviolence. So the justification is, why would you do no uh, nonviolent direct action? Sometimes in response to an instance of substantial and clear injustice, when on alternative ways to achieve the objective have been exhausted, when done in coordination with other groups, and the last thing I said is, in the situation that we face, when humanity's uh, survival is potentially under threat. So there are also objections to civil disobedience, and I think we should note that. Civil disobedience is sometimes said to be a divisive force in society. Since civil disobedience is normally designed to attract public attention, it can lead people as a result to think of resorting to disobedience and to achieve whatever changes in law or policy they find justified. That's one argument given. The other is civil disobedience can encourage more than just other civil disobedience. It can encourage a general disrespect for the law, particularly where the law is perceived as being lenient towards certain kinds of offenses. And ultimately, civil disobedience can be seen as an anti-democratic uh, uh, act because uh, sometimes it is seen as undermining, and there are many good examples, of formal democratic participatory processes. So I thought I'll just quickly say that many of the changes that we've had have been informed by, in the workers' uh, struggle, by the Luddites and the Industrial Revolution, the women's movement and the suffragists' movement, uh, so, uh, the direct action was critical, in the anti-apartheid movement, certainly the same. In the civil rights movement, 
uh, very much the same. And this brings us to asking this question in the moment that we find ourselves. By the way, my colleagues assure me that everybody in England knows what Queensberry rules. Okay, it's boxing rules. It comes from boxing, but sort of where you play within very const you know, defined rules. And I think we've reached a time now, not simply to say we have to think out of the box, we have to throw the box away altogether and engage in lateral and creative and innovative thinking way beyond uh, what we've been able to do so far. Yes, Cornel West. What do you tell Stalker. people who are scared to protest because they're worried that they'll get arrested, beaten, or just simply surveilled in the massive surveillance grid that exists today? Well, one, I was blessed to go to jail because I was willing to bear witness and deal with the consequences. I would do it again, but there's no doubt there's an increasing repression. There's an attempt to create a culture, not just of silence, but a culture of fear, especially for the younger generation, to intimidate them, to make sure they're so afraid that they're not willing to step out, bear witness in public, and have to deal with the consequences of, of civil disobedience. We just simply have to have more courage that we're, we're dealing now with a much more autocratic and authoritarian state and you have to be more courageous. You have to be more courageous to tell you the truth. You have to be more willing to deal with the cost. And in the end, uh, some of us simply have to die, that's all. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the chilling effect is what they're counting on. Look at the two faces. She's in a state of shock at what he said. And he's like, yeah, come on, you should have heard this all before. Uh, and I have to say, that's what's happening around the world at the moment. People are losing their lives in quite a significant level. Uh, I mean, what happened in Ukraine, what's happening in Syria, I think you have to be quite blind, really, not to actually see that, in fact, the fragmentation and the disintegration of uh, that's happening and you look at the literature on Syria and you'll see that actually climate impacts was one of the uh, impacts. So I'm going to quickly say the recent examples we saw in Gezi Park. It was a protest around one public park that became a national uh, protest. Um, around the Keystone XL pipeline, civil disobedience and direct action stopped President Obama from authorizing this a year ago. He might still do it. Uh, but right now, there's a spirited campaign. Lots of people engage in uh, direct action. And uh, for the first time, certain people like Bill McKibben, the leader of 350.org, you know, spent uh, prison time and was, was recognizing that we had to do it. Uh, we are seeing around fracking in US, UK, Romania, uh, increased levels of direct action. This year, is a protest in India against coal, where this company has taken us to court. And I'll quickly say the other problem that we face is something called SLAP suits, S-L-A-P-P, -P, which stands for Strategic Litigation Against Public Participation. In Canada, for example, at the moment, we have a company called Resolute, including this company in India, that's taking us to court with a 7 million damages claim. Not because they need the 7 million, not because it's going to help them, but basically they want to tie us in knots so that we forget about the campaign against them and we actually start getting into a protection mode. And that's why it's called, those legal actions are basically strategic litigation to prevent public participation. That's why they are called um, slap suits. So Greenpeace has this approach, which if you look at the red, it's called ideal, where we first investigate, then document, then expose, then act, and then lobby. And if you look at the Arctic work, we did all of that before getting to the point of act. So on investigate, we had a submersible submarine first go down uh, in Alaska, look at if there was oil drilling, what impacts that we have. We document that, we share that with the world. And even with the exposing of the Arctic sea ice minimum level being reached, uh, a year before Phil and the team went to the Arctic, I was there with another team with the same ship at the same rig. And that moment we were there was the moment when the Arctic sea ice minimum level reached its lowest ever point. And as my American friends like to say, when they go to Las Vegas, they say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Sadly, dear brothers and sisters, what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Its impact is global. And I'm happy to see that finally, 
American journalists reporting on the weather have started calling it the polar vortex, the Arctic freeze, and so on, because what's the extreme weather that we are seeing is connected to the Arctic sea ice. And ACT is what Phil and his team did. And of course, lobby in Davos, I was able to speak to Ban Ki-moon and say that given what we call, thanks to the efforts of my colleagues, the world knows now that we have this challenge and that we have to address it. And, uh, and I ask you to work with us to get the upper Arctic declared a global sanctuary, not dissimilar to the Antarctic being declared as a global common good solely for scientific and educational purpose. I'm run out of time, so th th this is uh, where Phil and the team were. I think this story has received a lot of um, coverage, so I will probably just play this quick one. <laughs> Those are bullets being fired by the Russian authorities. Okay, you get the picture. Uh, so, my final slide. Why is direct action so critical now? And what do we need to do? I think we will be judged very harshly by our children and their children if we do not summon the courage to develop the ways forward that will not secure the planet. Because I want to just assure you that the planet does not need saving. Because if you warm this planet up and humanity cannot live on it, the planet will still be there. Bruised and battered it might be. But it'll be in a better shape afterwards, because the forests will replenish, the oceans will come back. So don't worry about the planet. <laughs> the planet's going to be fine. What is at stake, and what is the struggle about, is to secure the possibility that for generations and generations to come, humanity can live justly, peacefully, sustainably, and equitably on this planet. We need to begin to ask whether, in fact, things that we do is actually real influence or is it just getting access and symbolic. What I mean by this, we go into meetings with, say, the United Nations, and quite often we get very thrilled if we're sitting there with uh, you know, high-profile people at the UN and we think we have influence. But I want to suggest that a lot of it is access without influence. And we need to begin to ask, how much of energy do we put into the formal intergovernmental processes and how much we put into action where we're working with people and really mobilizing real resistance? Because I can say quite categorically, nothing that I say to any politician, they don't know that's a view we hold and that they don't know that that's what we are thinking. So why bother, quite often is the sense you have, to repeating saying the same things and getting humiliated and treated um, disrespectfully. So what is at stake is too important for us to continue with the dithering and lack of political will by the political and business elites. We need to get them to understand, and now I'm going to conclude on an environmental note, that nature does not negotiate, that while yes we need to understand the shifting nature of power, we also now need to understand the shifting power of nature and we ignore it at our own peril and the peril of our children. The last thing I would say is what we need to do more urgently than ever before is go beyond an approach which is simply about maintaining the current system, recovering the current system, and protecting the current system because the current system does not work for the overwhelming majority of people on the planet. What we need is system redesign, system innovation, and system transformation. And unless we do that, we will be providing false solutions that will take us closer and closer to the precipice of disaster. And even though I might be violating what that very kind woman in the United States told me, 
about not sounding too depressed and too pessimistic, I think it is not a contradiction to speak the truth, but speak it in a way that ends like I'm going to end now by saying, we have it within the capability of human ingenuity to address the challenge of climate change. It is not that the solutions are not known. It is political will that is lacking. And like it or not, history teaches us that direct action is the best tool that we have to push our leaders to get the political will to do that which they do know they really need to do so that we can secure this planet for our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much. Kumi, you did not disappoint. Uh, thank you for that incisive, uh, insightful, and passionate uh, presentation on, on the key issues. Uh, and I think you've raised them. Uh, I'm sure many people in the audience will have questions that they want to address to you. Uh, if there are people still downstairs in the overflow room, um, I think there are a couple of seats up here, but you're also welcome to come and stand at the back uh, if you'd like to ask any questions. So um, you're welcome to come up. This is being webcast uh, and recorded, so if you don't want to be webcast and recorded, I suggest you don't ask a question. Um, <laughs> but uh, who'd like to go first? Yeah, the gentleman right back there. Thank you, Kumi. I'm speaking, I think, as the oldest person in the room, and therefore most guilty, possibly. Um, I'm a member of the Campaign Against Climate Change. Uh, they held a march now 18 months ago. That will be the last one they will hold. It was when London came to a halt for people to protest against climate change. Uh, we won't hold another one, and it, actually this is tearing our organisation apart, because if it fails again, it will just be the end of the organisation. So I hope that if we do hold one, everybody here, at least with a British passport and still in the country, um, will be with us. I just want to say that Gordon Clark closed the Climate Forum two weeks ago, speaking to an audience very similar to this, and he said to, and some of you were probably there, it's your responsibility, I'm going to buy you tickets on coaches and trains to go to London to demonstrate. And I had to put my hand up to a previous speaker who said the same thing, because that's exactly not what's true. Don't go to London, don't demonstrate, unless you take your parents with you. It's not your responsibility, it's ours, and it's shirking our responsibility not to re recognise that. So it's a sort of question, Kimi. Great, I think we'll take that. We'll take that as a, a comment at, at this point. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Why don't you grab this? So um, you had said before that climate change was unique and that it threatens our survival, but in some sense you could argue that the threat of nuclear war was not unique, uh, makes that not unique then in that case. Um, I mean, I think they're probably different, and I, I, I presume you get asked this question a lot, but I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about what the main difference is. Is it just that nature doesn't negotiate between the threat of nuclear war and climate change? Great, so why, is, um, why was the nuclear threat not as bad as the climate threat? <laughs> The nuclear threat is not a threat that's gone away. Uh, and it's still, uh, you know. Uh, Tom? <laughs> Someone's leaning against the switch at the back there. Oh, there you go. Thanks very much. You're welcome to come in, but not turn the lights out. Okay. There, there are two <laughs> seats in the front here if um, two of you want to come forward. Okay, welcome. <laughs> so so the, the nuclear threat is still there because, you see, uh, if people in the nuclear industry came in front of us, looked us in the eye and said, folks, we can guarantee, I'm not, I'm not even talking about nuclear weapons, I'm talking about nuclear energy now, right? If they say, we can guarantee that in any nuclear power plant, there will never be human error. And let's say we, we, we accepted that. They say at no power plant, there will be a terrorist attack, even though my colleagues in Fra France just last year flew a paraglider into a 
nuclear facility with no problem, right? Uh, and let's say they say that there won't be any technical failure. The one thing the nuclear industry cannot look us in the eye and say with honesty, assuming we give them the benefit of the doubt on those three things, is that the storage of spent nuclear fuel at the end of the cycle is a huge problem because depending on the mixture, it takes between 200 to 1,000 years before the waste is no longer uh, a danger. So have this image in your mind that today, people who are archaeologists and so on go, they find cities, artifacts, temples and so on. Our children who choose to be archaeologists in the future would potentially find, you know. So, so in that sense, though nuclear is more dependent on a, you know, we're more concerned about nuclear accidents. With climate change, it's about accumulation of a set of greenhouse gases that, to be fair, we do not always know that this was a threat, but we've known it for more than 25 years, right? And we should have acted by, by now. And the current assessment presented by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, while Phil, two weeks literally after Phil and the Arctic 30 landed in prison, the IPCC report, uh, released its report, and they say we're running out of time, urgency is needed, and so on. But importantly, they say that we need to leave between 60 to 80 percent of known oil, coal, and gas reserves where they are if we are to stand a chance to prevent catastrophic climate change. And right now, that is certainly not where we are, with new fossil fuel projects being proposed you know, all the time. So in that sense, one is more of a cumulative effect, and, and in some ways, both are you know, scary in different ways, but I think the difficulty from a scientific point of view that I find is that whenever I talk to any scientist and say, you know, you all have been talking about catastrophic climate change, runaway climate change, after we surpass, you know, depending who you talk to, one and a half or two degrees uh, warming based on, you know, and, and, and I say, you know, uh, how do you square that up with the reality? And, and, and quite frankly, there is a complete disconnect between what the science knows, I mean, what the science says, and what facts on the ground and the political response. And, and the situation is, no scientist can tell you, right? Once we have reached that threshold of 1.5 or 2 degrees of temperature, what exactly catastrophic climate change would look like? And that's pretty scary. But sadly, the last 10 years, we've seen a 100% increase virtually of extreme weather events. And I think we are getting a sense of what it looks like for the people in, uh, you know, in Africa, in Philippines, in Pacific Island states, and so on. And I, I would argue, in the end, that our very survival as a species is, un uh, is under threat. And both constituted, because if you have an individual nuclear accident of a particular magnitude, that could also obviously threaten humanity's existence. Great. Um, Clara, why don't you work your way through? I'm going to take three questions at a time. If you, you can yeah, take yeah. note, yeah. yeah. We'll take the three down the back. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really great. Um, I have a, a question about one of your slides. You, you mentioned um, the use of pesticides and its contribution to global crisis. And I'd like to bring up maybe the, the controversial point of Greenpeace's um, anti GMO. <laughs> Uh, status and, and why, G why Greenpeace are still uh, contributing to the discussion that GMOs are harmful. Okay, that's a very important issue and I look forward to Kumi's response um, on that. Uh, Kumi, I just had a very practical question. I'm wondering what are the sort of critical preparations or experiences from your life that's uh, trained you in becoming an effective agent in mobilizing uh, direct uh, nonviolent action and larger social change? Uh, I'm just wondering, when, if ever, would Greenpeace start um, promoting campaigns to uh, help humanity deal with the effects of climate change as opposed to trying to prevent it any further? Uh, let me take the last question first. That's an excellent question, which goes to the question of uh, whether we put all our efforts into what's called mitigation, which is trying to prevent uh, emissions, or whether we put effort into adaptation. Now, uh, both obviously are being done at the moment, but I would say your, your question suggests correctly that in fact the emphasis is more on mitigation rather than adaptation. And partly why 
is that if you start saying we put more energy into adaptation, you're basically throwing in the towel and saying that in, and, and that route will only be able to protect the most wealthiest of people on the planet. You know, in Manhattan, they're going to build a big uh, wall around the uh, city to keep the seawater out. I'm based in Amsterdam at the moment. They've got a whole plan, a multi-billion dollar plan. I can tell you that the people of Bangladesh, where already the sea level rise has contaminated the groundwater and they can't grow food and so on, they're not going to have the resources to do that. So both are needed, right? Both are needed. And we have to choreograph a little more carefully how we get the balance between the two, right? Because clearly the climate impacts are happening. We have to adapt to it. But we have to find the right proportionality of investment between mitigation efforts and adaptation efforts. And you are right in your question that Greenpeace does not talk as much on adaptation as probably we should. But that's a conversation we're actually having at the moment of how to find that right proportionality. Uh, then on the question of uh, critical experiences, I think, you know, one of the questions in my PhD thesis uh, that I did for Oxford, in it, I looked at the sole question of how do people move to activism? And I made this distinction between awareness and consciousness, where I said consciousness was uh, applied awareness, if you want. You know, anybody can be aware. Uh, I mean, quite often, many people are not aware because of the ideological state apparatus, to use Louis Althusser's word. But even being aware does not necessarily move you to say, I'm willing to act. I think you know, people like Ian and myself who had the privilege or the lack of the privilege of coming from South Africa where we saw you know, you know, where the choice was made for you by the, by the context where you had to act. Um, and, and I learned, I mean, you know, I, 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 I used to say this to my supervisor when I was at Oxford uh, towards the end of my time, Stan, I said, Stan, you know, I love you very much, but I hope you realize that what I learned from seven years of activism before I fled South Africa uh, is a thousand times what you and Oxford University is ever going to teach me. So, uh, so you might be upset with that, but don't be. I mean, I, I think experiential learning, experiential learning has to be, uh, you know, has to be given much more value, not just in my world, but in, in, in the world more, more generally. So I think, you know, like when my, my daughter's here with me, I won't point out and embarrass her, but, but when she was much younger, one day she, and she denies we had this conversation, but when she was much younger, she said, Dad, uh, it was when I was stuck in Ethiopia where two of my colleagues from the Global Call to Action Against Poverty were languishing in prison and I couldn't get out in time for a Christmas appointment we had. And she said, Dad, you're pretty crap at your job, aren't you? <laughs> I said, why? She said, no, you've been fighting on poverty for so long, on gender equality for long, on human rights, and look at this poor Netsanet and Daniel, they've been in prison for two and a half years, you've gone there five times, and you still haven't got them out of prison. So, I, so I'm telling you that story partly because you have to be comfortable with failure, right? And, and understand that it's actually not failure, that the struggle for justice is a marathon, it's not a sprint, and that the real contribution you can make is to have perseverance, tenacity, and, and stay with it until those injustices are eradicated. And on the pesticides issue, uh, so Greenpeace does not support genetically modified organisms. I, I hope I got the question right. You were saying, why, 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 why don't we support it? Okay, so essentially all our research and the research done by the International Annual Agricultural Assessment, which has the UN, World Bank, and other agencies in involved, if you look at exactly what they say about the exaggerated claims made by the GMO industry, it doesn't stack up. I myself had an open attitude until five years ago. I served, and let me in transparency, I served on the Gates Foundation Global Advisory Board on Agriculture. I sat through it, I read tons of documents. This was way before I joined Greenpeace. And it, it came absolutely clear to me, and my colleagues when I joined at Greenpeace have confirmed that in fact, what we are seeing in Africa, for example, like in Africa, the majority of farmers are women. They do not need big Western companies coming in with their, uh, um, with genetically altered seeds, which also come with the expectation that fertilizers need to be also bought from those same companies and so on. And I mean, it's a long, long story. Uh, and of course, the industry has made many, many 
exaggerated claims about certain kinds of rice and how that can solve nutritional deficiency. But when you talk to the people who are working in the front line of children's nutritional efficiency, such as the Global Alliance for Investment in Nutrition, they will tell you that it's absolutely uh, you know, exaggerated claims that do not stack up. So, but I think that requires a longer conversation, so please catch me at the... Yeah, at and the I, I, I think um, actually maybe we should have a, a workshop or a, a lecture and discussion on GMOs. I think it's a very crucial issue. And I know just amongst my colleagues in Oxford, uh, who are part uh, of our Future of Food and Farming group, our Future of Plants group, uh, there's very active debate and research on this issue. So I, I, I think we'll definitely take you up on that. All right, another round of questions. Yes, my question. Uh, some, some of us who are in the learning process of uh, how to make changes and make the situation better, uh, not heading to where we're going right now. Um, sometimes persuading yourself on everyday issues is hard enough. How can you bring people along with you? And this is where my question comes from. Apart from Facebook, Twitter, demonstrations, petitions, and all that, which we already know, can we reinvent other ways in which we uh, go beyond preaching to the converted and shake the comfortable and obedient middle-income people? I don't believe in middle classes. Middle-income people to join action in 21st century? The short answer is, yes, we can. Uh, we, uh, and, and, and that's where it gets... Um, well, many of the specific examples you gave of citizen action are valid and that they do add value. Uh, what we need to always try to do is to ensure that we have a toolbox of different... Uh, options of activism. And because, you see, you can't have a, like a one-size-fits-all approach because you've got to understand that activism always happens in a context, a particular national, cultural, local, religious context. And I, and I tell you, we're struggling with this all the time at Greenpeace. So, for example, if our office in Brazil takes two scantily clad samba dancers to Brussels, right, to go in front of all the ministers to protest against European common fisheries policy, right? Now, I saw the photograph. This happened before I joined Greenpeace. I saw the photograph. All the ministers were concentrating, right? Uh, very much. Uh, now, that might have worked in Europe and might have worked in Brazil, but it didn't work in the Arab region, didn't work in Indonesia, didn't work in, in certain parts of the country. Uh, you know, certain parts. So, so, you know, so, I just want to say that, yes, we can develop new ways, and people are developing new ways all the time. I don't know exactly what all those new ways are, but I think that we are in a world now where people like you and people like me Maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe it's a wrong assumption, but like people like me who have been failing for many years doing this work uh, need to join with and, and co-create new ways of doing things. I would just urge, though, that do not uh, be either dismissive of the social media potential or be too kind of, oh my God, social media is going to save us. Because... I think social media can add a really, really powerful contribution, but like all things, it needs to have the appropriate interconnections and interfacing between other forms of activism. As my friends in Egypt said, we used Facebook to organize the demonstrations at Tahrir Square. We used Twitter to tell people where to go, when to go, how to go, and then we used YouTube to tell the world, look what we did. And but when you look at all three uses of the technologies, that they were all geared to a very conventional outcome, which was people in the streets saying no. Right? But, so, so it's about getting the right complementarities.
Okay, Kumi, no, no direct action in responding directly to the first sorry, question. Yeah, I'm going to collect I'm three. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, I will come to the side of the, the room next. Hi, uh, given how truly global climate change is, how does Greenpeace decide which project or which stakeholder to target in order to be most effective? Okay, anyone else on the side? No, nope. right, let's go down here, the, uh, those two hands, and then we'll... I think my question relates to the lady's query earlier about direct action generally, but given that a lot of us are, well, gr we grow up under a climate of fear, whether it's losing your job, getting a criminal record, being thrown in prison, um, fearing for looking after your family, how do you motivate people beyond that? Because ultimately, yes, we all do care about the planet, which is for our children, for the next generation, but if you're worried about losing your job, which then means you cannot support your family, how do you motivate people beyond that fear, beyond the bigger fear, which is obviously climate change? That's, I think that's quite a different or difficult thing to tackle culturally throughout the world. There was a, yeah. So my question is related, but perhaps one step back. So how do you target and um, make people take that extra step of saying, not only I, you know, I support um, policies that would mitigate climate change, but I'm willing to make that sacrifice in my life because it does take a sacrifice. And getting people to say something, you know, getting people to move beyond just making a tweet or tweeting or whatever about it, and then actually doing something, to me, seems like a, a very big step sometimes. Okay, great, um, Kumi. Okay, thank you for those questions. I just want to give full, uh, quick uh, heads up. After I answer these questions, I'd love for you to come up and just share with people on these last three questions on why you did what you did, because I think they go to uh, the questions that have been raised quite fundamentally. So, firstly, I think we must acknowledge it's extremely difficult to do what is necessary for us to do, and it's always been difficult. Motivating people to stand up and risk their lives or risk prison time and risk a, a record, these are all things that are terrifying to most of us. And, and, and you know, I, I can say I have many criminal records. Uh, I, I don't like to, I don't particularly like it, you know. I, I get asshole when I travel all over the place because, you know, they know I've been deported from this place and so on. So I totally get it, uh, th that at the personal level. But I think what has to be balanced here, and always injustice and how we respond to injustice always kind of comes up because when we put in an honest and open and brutally candid, frank way what we are facing, then in fact, uh, bottom line is um, people should, if we as activists learn to speak in more accessible ways to people, uh, because the truth is, we are also part of the problem. Because like, you go to climate negotiations, man, the acronyms they use there is outrageous. The first one I went to Copenhagen, everybody was going on about Lulu CF, Lulu CF. I don't know what they were talking about. Uh, one out of 25 different things. Does anybody want know what's Lulu CF here? Okay, at least you all have lives. Okay, so she doesn't have lives. No, no. <laughs> no, no. So, so, so I'm sitting there, I don't know now whether to ask what is Lulu CF and expose how stupid I am or whether to wait. And, and I'm thinking, you know, it must be somebody's name because the only association I had was the, my class girl when I was seven years old called Lulu. So anyway, at the end of it, it turns out that it stands for land use, land use change for forestry, right? And I mean, and like that, that's just one example out of 20. So part of what we need to do is to be ex simple, not simplistic, respectful, not uh, dominating. And the main trick of activism is you start where people are. And the main failure of activism is those of us who are in leadership, who are already on board, they project their consciousness on the people that they're trying to organize and are impatient and, 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 and activism is a journey. We have to start from where people are and build, and, and the truth is it takes time. And, 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 and I want to say that it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, motivation though will come, I think motivation will come from multiple places. One is we need to have a positive motivation. We have to be saying to people, actually, 
it's within our grasp that we can reconfigure our en entire energy system and move from a brown, dirty, fossil fuel-based energy driven economy to a clean, clean green, renewable-based driven economy, and to say what that would mean, that would not only address the issues of climate, but it will potentially clean up our atmosphere, protect our water security, et cetera, et cetera. Then on which target is the most effective and how you choose it, and uh, the, your question was how do we do it? My short answer is with extreme difficulty, because it is really difficult to find the right target um, when there are so many targets. So when we went after Gazprom, it was clear. It was the first company that was going to open up drilling in the Arctic. And with those, I'd like to ask you to welcome Phil Ball to <laughs> <the> Arctic. <laughs> so what, do I use this one? So what motivated me to uh, make that change? I mean, I'm not, I'm not the you know, in instinctively radical activist. I live in West Oxfordshire, um, <laughs> <laughs> about five miles away from Mr. Cameron. Um, I used to work quite a lot for the BBC Natural History Unit. I've travelled the world. I've seen some amazing places. Um, and that was a great motivation. You know, I didn't want to see those places screwed up by what industry and uh, politics was doing. Um, but, you know, when I saw uh, on the news and heard about what was happening at Newbury Bypass years ago in the, in the 90s, I was, I was very cross and angry and motivated to do something. But those things that were mentioned, you know, the fear of arrest, the fear of standing out, the fear of people going, what the hell are you doing, um, stopped me. And I didn't get involved. And I always felt a bit bad about that. But I didn't really get involved apart from writing the old letter and getting cross. Um, but what changed for me was having kids. You know, I wasn't prepared to stand there and just let, let their future be screwed up by these companies and these governments who were doing nothing. So yeah, um, it, was, it was the very act of having kids that, that, that changed things for me. What are the other questions? I can't remember. <laughs> um, th there will be... There will be time um, to you know, chat to Phil and Kumi uh, shortly when we break for uh, our drink. So let me just take the final round because there were some more people at the back on the right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll take those three hands up there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. You made a very convincing argument for engaging in protest and uh, nonviolent direct action for big systemic radical changes. And I'd be curious to know your opinion on um, making very small, non-systemic, non-radical, boring changes in one's own life, like turning off the lights, like pushing for your institutions to have things like recycling um, and maybe timers on their lights, like flying less or carbon offsetting your flights. What is the role of all that in sort of this debate? My question is for Mr. Naidu. Uh, is it the case that when you are showing civil disobedience, you have to be an activist? Uh, I am drawing the example from India, where a political party is, showing, is trying to uh, question the status quo. Then the whole academic circle, intellectual, are labeling them as anarchists and uh, you know they are labeling them as activists. So, is uh, the civil disobedience is only for some particular set of people? Thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. My question is, what would you advise to those who are involved in the campaign in how not to get into despair and not to lose hope if the results are not immediate? Thank you. Did you get that? Okay, I'll take these two last hands and then... Sorry. There's one more person. Did you get the last question? Multimedia. Do you want to repeat that question? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, it was very inspiring. Thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> oh, that's Which, why I said that. <laughs> my question is, what would you advise to those particular students who are involved in campaigning, and if the results are not immediate, how not to get into despair, not to lose hope? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. 
Hi. Um, I had a question that feeds into a couple of the other questions and some comments that you made about um, experiential learning and how we can sort of access the unconvinced cohorts. I wouldn't necessarily say that they were um, middle income, but um, in general, um, what place might activist research um, have in, um, in, in helping a, a, as a platform for accessing these people? How can we clean up the um, image of activist research in a situation where oftentimes researchers are the people that are on, in the field, meeting the people, getting to know the real situation, um, loving the people, loving the environment, loving whatever it is they're researching, and then they are confronted by um, the objectivity constraints of academic institutions and their, the way that they're allowed to report their research. And I wondered whether or not you had an opinion on that and how we can, how as a, a DPhil student I can face that, for example. Okay, uh, the person with their hand has the last word of questions. <laughs> Um, thank you for your talk. I'm interested in the rhetoric of climate change. You've al already mentioned that you're glad that our meteorologists are talking about the polar vortex, and you also touched on the kind of linguistic inadequacy of the war on terror. But our, the way that we describe climate change and global warming, these are very tepid metaphors for a red hot topic. So I was wondering if you thought maybe we could rebrand in some way, in a way that would agitate people, in a way that perhaps global warming doesn't quite. Okay, uh, Kumi. And Phil, you have three minutes for seven questions. <laughs> so, Phil, say, is there anything you'd like to pick up? It's only a drink that stands between your answering and. Okay, so you yeah, go yeah, first. That's great yeah. motivation. I'm going to answer it quickly. Um, yeah, how do we motivate people? Uh, it's, it's a very difficult one. Climate change is a bit, like you say, quite boring. I mean, call it climate disaster, because it's going to be a disaster. You know, I heard at a discussion at, um, in Westminster recently that. Um, that, that what was done by Hitler and Stalin would look like a tea party uh, when you look at what, how climate change is going to you know, affect society. You know, we, need to, we need to get those facts and, and relate them to the population and, you know, and, and stop talking about you know, the, these, these sort of half-assed uh, statements about the climate just warming up a bit and, hey, we can grow grapes in Kent. You know, like, really, get a grip. We're talking about famines. We're talking about forest fires. We're talking about the Amazon burning to the ground. You know, we're talking about serious climate disaster. It's not climate change. It's not small. It's big. It's quite scary. Can I ask you to put your hands together? It's a big thank you. Thank you. So the, so the one thing that Phil has challenged all of you who consider Oxford your permanent home is that you can come from ex Oxford and you can have the privilege of being in a Russian prison for 100 days if you stand up for justice. <laughs> so, uh, just quick responses to the first question. Small changes are critically important. Everything that you mentioned are things that we encourage people to do because I think that apart from those individual actions having a tiny impact in their own right, they begin to build a critical mass for policy makers because I'm seeing in places where citizens have got together in, even in London, organizing and putting solar panels themselves outside of what government does as creating a groundswell of energy from below that actually, you know what, this is what people want. We should look at providing them. So I would say that the scale of the problem is so big, it's going to require multiple, multiple efforts. And I would say those small but powerful acts of individual action are important, they add value, and we should celebrate and expand them. On the question of uh, civil disobedience, is it only people who are activists who engage in it? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, we saw... Uh, Cornell West is a full-time Harvard academic. That's his, his job, right? But he steps out of his comfort zone from time to time. And like that, as we know, we're seeing political leaders can sometimes do it from different parties. We see trade union leaders doing it. Uh, and most importantly, let me just be quite blunt. I do not think we can win on the climate struggle if our religious leaders of the world and our trade union leaders of the world 
do not step forward and argue as passionately as any environmentalist does why we need to act. And the good news is, whereas in the past, we used to talk about red-green tensions, the tensions between labor and environmentalists. Today we are talking about a red-green alliance and partnership. And the, one of the most eloquent sentences I heard in any discussion at the United Nations on climate change did not come from a traditional environmentalist, came from Sharon Burroughs, the head of the, the first woman to head the global trade union movement, where she told Ban Ki-moon in Rio Plus 20 meeting in Brazil, she said, Secretary General, you might be surprised why me as a trade unionist I am so passionate about climate change when my main job is to defend jobs and promote jobs and work for more decent work. She said, because, Mr. Secretary General, as a trade unionist, we understand that there are no jobs on a dead planet. Right? So that is the kind of things linked to the question that came from the back in terms of how we get that narrative going. And I think Phil's taken us in the right direction, climate disaster, climate chaos. And we have to show how it's going to impact on simple things, on water. You know, are we going to have water? Are we going to be able to eat food? If we are killing our oceans, one billion people on the planet depend on our fo uh, oceans for protein. You know, so we have to find the human connections to climate change, and it has to be more human-centric. To my sister who asked the question about the research role, uh, man, you've really gave me a sense of deja vu, because my PhD supervisor at Oxford right at the end came under pressure by the Oxford establishment to ask the same question. I was writing my PhD on a topic that I was an agent within, right? So in the interest of time, my thesis is at the Bodleian. Go to chapter two. <laughs> Go to chapter two on, t on the conceptual approach. I'm being serious. There is a whole section called academic insiderism, right? Where I deal with this issue because I was thrown, to use a cricket analogy, a googly by my supervisor right towards the end and I had to spend four months working on this chapter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I want to just end with the motivation thing, right? Somebody asked about uh, the person right at the back about, you know, from my early experience. So people sometimes ask me, like, how do you have the energy to, you know, keep going and so on? So all of us is within our capability to find the inspiring people, inspiring ideas, in inspiring writers, inspiring movies, inspiring religious imagery, whatever moves you. We need to go and find that for our own lives and make sense. For me, what had a fundamental transformative effect was having been motivated to get involved in the struggle against apartheid at the age of 15. At the age of 15, you don't know too much, right? Like, you know, we were marching in the front, the slogan was, we want equality, by the time it went to the back, we want a color TV, people <laughs> were, were shouting. <laughs> All of that doesn't matter. Part of activism is about feeling the comfort to make mistakes. If our politicians and our business leaders make so much of mistakes, getting paid so much of money, why can't we make a few mistakes and when we're doing it voluntarily most of the time? Right? But I conclude with this story, which is a true story. It's a sad story, but it's intended to be motivational. Because this is my daily, motiv this is my daily motivation. When I was 22 years old, fleeing to Oxford. My best friend at that time was a guy called Lenny Naidu, same surname, no relation. And he asked me a question. He said, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution we can make to the cause of justice and humanity? And I said, giving your life. And he said, you mean like what's happening in our country at the moment, going out, getting participating in demonstration, getting shot and killed and becoming a martyr? I said, yeah, I guess so, because that time in South Africa when we were having this conversation, every weekend we were at funerals. And he said, no, Kumi, that's a wrong answer. He said, it's not giving your life, but giving the rest of your life. I was 22 years old at that time. My friend Lenny was the biggest philosopher amongst us. He was way ahead of his time, first environmentalist I know. And I have it on reliable information that he was one of only 1,000 vegetarians on the entire African continent at that time. <laughs> uh, and so anyway, we flee in different directions into exile. I'm here at Oxford. He's in uh, Angola. Or so I thought. And then, anyway, I get a call at Modern College, where I was based, telling me that my friend Lenny and three young women from my home city were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime less than two, and a, two years after we fled into exile. And, of course, I thought deeply about our last conversation and this distinction that he made between giving your life and giving the rest of your life. And it's a very important distinction, a fundamentally important. 
if Robert Mugabe got killed in 1981 or died of a heart attack, even natural causes, in 1981, the world would have recorded Robert Mugabe as a revolutionary hero, as a fighter for independence from Britain, etc., etc. But Mugabe turned 90 last week. He's been in power for 30 years. So, so it's very easy to go participate in a demonstration, get shot and killed. It doesn't take much skill. The real skill or the real commitment is to survive it, walk away from it, and be willing to say, I will continue to push and push and fight and fight until we win. So I leave you with this line. It's not about dying for your country or dying for our children. It's about living for our country and living for our children. And it is within the grasp of human ingenuity that big a challenge as climate change is with political will, with citizens standing up and saying enough is enough and no more, we know what needs to be done, we can do it, yes it will be difficult. If we do that, I genuinely believe we can secure our children and grandchildren's future and we can live in a more equitable, more balanced and more just world in centuries to come. Thank you very much. Kumi, I think the fact that everyone is here when they could be going next door to drink uh, has stayed. Uh, and we do get people drifting away from our events to the end. Uh, and you can, I hope, see from the sense of engagement of everyone the fantastic effect uh, that your lecture has had. Uh, made us think through the issues again uh, and hopefully clarified our minds uh, as to direct action uh, when and why. Uh, let me just before we go next door, uh, bring to your attention a number of forthcoming events here. At the moment, we're running a seminar series on Thursdays at 3.30 uh, on the interface between uh, people and machines. It's called Blurred Lines, the Changing Dynamics Between Man and Machine. This coming Thursday, the 27th, uh, Alex Liebenhaus and Dapo Kendo from our group on Human Rights for Future Generations and our Institute of Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict will be talking about drones and the ethics around drones, the interface of man and machine with drones. On the 6th of March, we'll be talking about sensors everywhere, the sensorization of our environment from our Future of Computing group. And on the 13th of March, we'll be talking about whether we're gonna be replaced by robots and the opportunities for information, automation, uh, of jobs, and that's Carl Frey uh, and Michael Osborne who've written a paper which many of you would have seen picked up in the media, uh, which suggests that up to 46% of jobs might be lost to technological change. So a very rich set of seminars, and then to celebrate International Women's Day, which is of course on the 8th of March, we have on the 6th of March, uh, Baroness Helena Kennedy, who is a very distinguished human rights lawyer uh, now, uh, head of an Oxford College, Mansfield, talking about the fight for women's rights and what we can learn from successes and failures so far. So that's on the 6th of March at 5.30 uh, here in this lecture theatre. Uh, there are many other things to take part. Those of you that know, don't know the Oxford Martin School, I encourage you to look at our website. There's something happening every day. And I also encourage you to look at our commission for Future Generations report, which talks about the sort of creative coalitions uh, which Kumi alluded to. But it remains to thank you once again for coming, to thank Kumi for a fantastic lecture and inspiring talk, and to invite you all to join us next door uh, for a drink. <laughs>